live, it says. There's live. Then broadcast. We've gone live, but whether we'll be. Um, um, I'm just going to refresh my YouTube. Oh, no. There we go. We're there. All right. This is what it's like doing all my online teaching. You just sit there in silence for a couple of minutes because you've got to be there ready before it starts. Exactly. What I'll do is I'll hold up so people know that this is not when the show is. Uh, I'll just hold up the terrible lizards. The, the, look at the expenses made. We're starting at eight. It's not yet eight. So I'll just hold this here. It's lovely. Dave's been complaining of feeling slightly wheezy because he's paranoid. And uh, I've got a lovely little spot over there because I've got to do some filming tomorrow. And it's like my face knows. And every time my face just goes, oh, Izzy, you've got to actually look nice. It just goes, no spots. Um, but there we go. And that's about murder, not about dinosaurs. So anyway, there we go. So already before we've even begun. Oh, we've begun now. It's eight o'clock. But before we've even begun, I should say hello to Esther, to Ross, to John and to John, who've already said hello. So hello. A uh, 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 to Esther, even though it's the evening, but I don't know how to say bon nighto. Hello, I'm Izzy Lawrence, it says they're there. Um, that there is Dave Hone, Dr. Dave Hone. Uh, we do a podcast called <laughs> Terrible Lizards, which I hope that you all listen to. And, and we had some big news today, and Dave said, we should go live. And I said, really? And he said, yes, so this is Dave's fault. Uh, but we, but the, the news is that a, a T-Rex was sold and not a live one. So it's to, tell us the story, Dave. This T-Rex, it's called Stan, isn't it? It is, it is Stan. So, so yesterday at Christie's in the US, I think in New York, uh, Stan sold for a total with all fees and gubbins in $31 million, um, which is an absolutely staggering sum of money, obviously, um, but something that I think no paleontologist saw coming at all. Um, and this has all kinds of interesting and all kinds of negative ramifications for paleontology and dinosaurs as a whole. And there's a whole complicated backstory to Stan, which I think most people don't realize. Um, and even to- He sounds to so easy. He's called Stan, surely. Yeah, He's a simple it's creature. Stan. I yeah, think I think in if he was in Dinner Ladies, his dad would have been in the Desert Rats. But um, I've been watching a lot of Dinner Ladies on Netflix. Excuse me, but but I mean, they, they, you say okay, so it's up for thirty-one million dollars. Yes. But how much they were they expecting for it to go for? So there was a there was an estimate doing the rounds or Christie's expected price of between six and eight. And I don't know of a paleontologist who thought it was going to go for that when we found out that Stan wow. was going for sale. And that number came up. There was quite a bit of discussion. I know quite a few colleagues, obviously, including Tyrannosaur experts and people who work on this stuff, who went, yeah, they'll never get six million. Not a hope in hell. And it's gone for five times Five that. times. Um, That's amazing. So boy, boy, were we wrong. Um, There's some serious dinosaur fans out there. That's all I can say. Well, Hang on. Yeah. And that's the thing we we've we know they're out there. You know, we know we know skeletons get sold. There is a there is a thriving legal market in various fossils. There is a thriving black market in various fossils, um, and and this happens. Um, and um, in well, we did a whole episode on this with Dan Schreiber, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, we, we? We discussed about this before, but but you know we're mostly talking about things that are going for tens of thousands. It is rare that things go for hundreds of thousands, and even things that go for the thick end of a million are you know are extraordinarily rare so there was a there was a diplodocus that sold a couple of years ago in paris and it was about a third to a half of a skeleton which remember for a big dinosaur is actually about normal you know you don't get every bone um and that went for something like three hundred and fifty thousand pounds which i guess is half a million us dollars uh, but Diplodocus is a big animal. There is not that many of them. They're hard to dig up. A huge amount of work would have gone into finding it, excavating it, preparing it, mounting it, and doing all the rest of it. And that you could have bought 60 of them for what yeah. just got right. That, that, that's the level that we're talking about. Um, now, John you know, Patterson says rightly that it actually sold for two, 27 and a half million. Somebody parted with $31 million, which is more interesting to me, the psychology behind that, because we don't know who bought it, do we? No, we don't. I mean, we could, we can make a pretty shrewd guess that it was someone with an oodles of money. I mean, and I know that sounds 
silly, but you know, I had a couple of questions come in Twitter and people go, well, you know, might it still end up in a museum? And it's like, I doubt anyone who's dropped 30 million on this is going to give it to a museum unless they want the world's biggest tax write-off. Um, <laughs> that and, might you know, explain it. I'm sure it hell wouldn't be a museum. So um, uh, Professor Paul Barrett, who's one of the curators of the National History Museum, pointed out, 30 million is something like two thirds of the annual operating budget of the Natural History Museum in London, which is a colossal institute, one of the biggest natural history museums in the world, has something like 80 million specimens in it and thousands of curators, researchers, cleaners, staff, and all the rest of it. You know, And they're all massive really dinosaur cool. fans. So do, yeah. do any of them have a secret $31 million hanging around to sort of spend yeah. on this? Well, not, not that I'm aware of. So that's the thing, you know, we, we do know of, you know, there are a couple of Google millionaire type people and Microsoft millionaire type people who are into this collection. Uh, we know Leonardo DiCaprio is fairly famous for buying stuff. But, but not 31 million. But, right, even people <laughs> like that, like dropping 30 million on something like this is, yeah. And, and again, extraordinary when things are often available for a fraction of that price. Um, you know, there's a there's a T-Rex doing that's on exhibition at the moment called Victoria. I know they were looking at selling that for about 10 a couple of years ago. I don't know if they'd have got anything like that money for it. Auctions always turn up odd things. But again, that's a third of that price. Um, yeah. So was there like a bidding war or something? Is that what happened? Yeah, or did we watched, not know? We watched the video. So a couple of people sent me timestamps of the auction because it was recorded. And I assumed if it went for anything like that, it would be two people who clearly wanted it. And it was going, you know, 21, 22, 23, 24. 20. And it wasn't. It was half a dozen bidders, certainly up as wow. far as 20 million. There were four or five different people who were still in it. Um, wow. Again, I completely didn't expect because we just didn't think there were that kind of numbers of people out there with that kind of money. Um, but getting away from just the pure numbers, like the, the whole, like the story and what this implies. So Stan is a weird animal. Stan has been on public display for years, if not decades, at a place called the Black Hills Institute uh, in Midwest US. Um, Black Hills Institute is a private concern. It is a private museum, privately owned, and Stan is a specimen within that collection. It's been on public display. You can go to the museum and pay and go in and see Stan. And many people have and many researchers have, but Stan was always private. So one big thing that you've, I've seen coming from this is there's lots of people going, how dare this leave the country or how dare this leave the museum? This should never have been sold, yada, 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 yada. This is not the Louvre selling off the Mona Lisa. This is not the Carnegie Museum selling off the original Diplodocus. These are not public collections. It is a private collection, and that's a privately owned specimen, and the owners can legally can do what the hell they like with it. And what they wanted to do was auction it. And what's interesting is they didn't even necessarily want to do that. Um, it's no big secret. There's, there's been a press release came out when, when Stan went to auction. Um, Black Hills was run by a, a, the Larson family. The two main brothers within that family have had a big falling out. I think that's really basically public knowledge at this point. I don't think I'm giving away any big secret. Um, there was a court order that one had to buy the other out of the company. Stan is the outstanding specimen in that company, which is obviously worth a fortune. It is very hard to evaluate what a T-Rex might be worth. And I believe that the sale, the sale of Stan, or at least the action of attempting to sell it, was a court order decision. So this wasn't even necessarily Black Hills themselves, per se, trying to cash in on Stan such as Black Hills being required to sell it. So, so yeah. I mean, is there, is, there, is there a lot of emotional, a bit, because you have already mentioned, you know, Dippy. So, I mean, is, is Stan a bit like Dippy? Do people actually love this T-Rex because it is Stan rather than I, um, I, just it's any T-Rex would have gone for this price? Well, that's the thing. I mean, there's been a lot of outpouring, but it's more than I expected. Um, Stan, on the one hand, is extremely well known. If, you, if you've been to many museums, um, you will have seen Stan because the Black Hills being a private concern and they are fossil collectors and dealers and they sell casts and mounts of things, um, have sold copies of Stan to God knows how many museums. I've seen Stan in loads of different places, often just the skull, often the whole skeleton. Um, if you buy 
copies of things. Uh, when we last did a live session, I held up a T-Rex tooth. That's one of Stan's teeth. Um, it's, it's really common. So you, many people watching this may not realize it, but they have actually seen Stan, if just not the original. Um, various bits of scientific work have been done on Stan, which is another part of the problem, um, because now there's the potential for Stan to absolutely vanish. You know, it's going into the foyer of some bank or going into some guy's house, and we're never going to see it again. Um, we don't know who who's what they plan to do with it, who it was, or anything. Well, you know, they they legally own it. If they want to put it through a wood chipper and use it to pave their driveway, they're allowed to. They own it. Wow. Well, they can. Wow. Somebody yeah. must somebody must hate Stan to do that to pay thirty one million for a bit yeah. of gravel. But the but the point is, from a legal point of view, if they own it and it's their property and they can do what they want in it because it is their property and it has no legal protection because of what it is, then they can. So how um, do you feel about private collectors versus public collecting as in, you know, museums and the rest of it? It's, Look at your face. <laughs> yeah, so, so, you know, there is inevitably a spectrum of paleontologists. Uh, there are people who are, let the market be the market. People should be able to do whatever they want. There shouldn't be protection on fossils. Let people buy, sell stuff, whatever. There are people who are every private ownership is evil and, you know, nothing should be owned by anyone ever. Those are extreme positions and there are not many people who occupy either of them. Um, but obviously, even if you move somewhere into the middle, there's a huge murky gray area. And I think most people would feel, and I'm broadly in this category, that it really comes down to what those things represent from a scientist, from a scientific point of view. And obviously I have a particular vested interest with my scientist hat on. But for example, I have no problem with kids going to the beach and finding an ammonite and taking it home and keeping it. I know people who would say that's private fossil ownership and shouldn't be allowed to happen. Oh, for God's sake. And when it's something like, you know, for, for people in the UK or familiar with the UK, you know, we've got Lyme Regis, the famous fossil site where Mary Anning worked and that, that whole stretch of, of coastline. You can walk up and down the beach and collect 100 bellum nights and a dozen ammonites in an hour if you want to. And people have been doing just that for centuries at this point. And they don't run out. I've been twice. Well, right. And, and so, you know, Yes, occasionally someone might find something spectacular or extremely rare or a very rare species, and that might up and end up in going in their house, and then no scientists ever saw it, et cetera, et cetera. But on a on a general point of view, the idea that anyone collecting that stuff is impinging or limiting science in any way, shape, or form clearly isn't the case. And if that's ha happening, I fail to see why people can have a very big problem with it. And then, of course, there's the there's the obvious positives, which is some people will become really enthused and engaged and want to learn more and do that. And so people finding and collecting that stuff, people buying and selling that stuff, I don't have a problem with that. I really don't. And I think, you know, and that extends further to things like these little fish you get from China, fish you get from a place called the Green River Formation in the US, um, certain dinosaur teeth, which are extraordinarily common in the right places. Certainly various things like shark's teeth would be ludicrously common. Is that your cat? It is my cat, yes. <laughs> um, Susan. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't have a problem because, yeah, if, if, I, if I or any of my colleagues wanted to go and study sawfish teeth from Morocco, we'd go out and, yes, it costs money to go to Morocco, but yada, yada, yada. You could end up with a few thousand teeth very quickly for your study. And someone else oh. could do someone else could do the same thing six weeks later if they wanted a thousand teeth for their study. Mm. So I don't have a problem with that being sold. And of course, the you know, as we move along the scale of these things, sooner or later you get to, well, what about a triceratops skull? What about a whole triceratops? What about a whole T-Rex? And of course, then you start getting into but know, but but we need to the, share this so that we can do research and find out. It's quite um yeah, yeah it's difficult. And, and, and that that's and and then things get complicated again. Um, so I'm working on a paper at the moment on some dinosaur stuff, and it's got a big data set in it. And one of the referees commented, "One of your specimens, that one, that's a privately owned specimen. You shouldn't be publishing on that specimen." Um, which a lot of people take that view. 
I generally do, and I do not usually publish or work on privately owned specimens. However, in the case of this one, it is one which has already been published on in the scientific literature. Mm. And so it's a private specimen, but the data is publicly available. And, and that's ultimately what the, the, the issue with private ownership is. And like we say, the fact that Stan could effectively vanish is there's you know a fundamental part of science should be replication, the ability to confirm and check results. And if I say, well, I saw Stan and I measured this bit of Stan or I've observed this feature and I write about it in a scientific paper and now Stan goes somewhere else, someone comes along and reads my paper and goes, oh, that's really interesting. But I'm wondering, Dave says he thinks it's this. But you know what? I reckon it, if he, I reckon if you look more carefully, he'd see that there's this kind of texture and that might mean it's this issue on the bone, not that issue on the bone. I will go and look at Stan and I will confirm whether Dave's right or whether I think he's wrong. Where is it? No idea. Who owns it? No idea. Will I be allowed to see it if I do know who owns it? No idea. Just so maybe there's some sort of middle ground, which is whereby dinosaurs, you need to, they're a bit like gun ownership. You need to actually register to get one or something or just say, I've got this well, and right. be open with it. But where, where, so again, where does it start and stop? Yeah, everyone would go dinosaurs and everyone would go mammoths and saber toothed tigers and hominid skeletons. And then it starts getting murky. And of course, even things that are not quite ten a penny, but you know, things like fossil fish, you know, Green River, again, you see, you go to any fossil fair, you go to certain places, you can just buy slabs of rock with these fish on, and, and deer and crocodiles and palm trees and absolutely brilliant brilliant preservation and most of that stuff is really common and it's expensive you know you'll pay tens of thousands for it but it is not beyond the realm of museums being able to buy them and museums have their own collections museums go digging etc 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 but of course one in a hundred or one in a thousand of those fish has something extraordinary even if that fish is super super common and it's like the goldfish of the green river yeah but this one preserves the color or this one preserves its stomach content, or this one preserves some of the muscles, um, or this is a pair which died together mating. And then, of course, well, right, so now how do we classify that one? Because it's this boring fish which we said doesn't need protection because it's really common, but we want that one. And who makes that judgment and decision, and how do you value it? All right, all right. Okay, so if the registry won't work, <laughs> what about? Now, Trevor and John have been sort of talking about, you know, the ways around this. And they're saying, well, Stan has got amazing casts made. So what's the difference? Why can't, why aren't the casts good enough? Right. Science. So, so, so there's, there's the first thing. So that's something that's happened with some specimens. So there's um, a T-Rex called Tristan, who is privately owned. And for the last seven, eight years, something like that has been on display in Berlin and has now gone from Berlin and has gone to Denmark, I want to say, but I'm not 100% sure, but it doesn't matter. Tristan stayed in Europe, but it's not in Berlin anymore. Tristan was like 3D scanned and 3D printed large chunks of it, and all that data is archived in Berlin. So Tristan, the original specimen, is privately owned, and you have this replication problem if you work directly on Tristan, but all that kind of data that those comments are talking about is technically available. So I think most people wouldn't have a problem with say doing something like, I've been measuring all the T-Rexes, I wanna measure the length of this skull, here is a cast of this skull, which is as far as we know, 100% accurate or 99.9% .9 accurate. So for a gross measurement, like the length of the skull and the diameter of the eye, it's fine. Anyone else can go and measure that thing after me that data exists, cool. That I think people are okay with. The problem is, of course, that's not all the data. Um, no. Huge amount of what we do with paleontology with, and with things like dinosaurs is, of course, just that kind of stuff, measuring skeletons and looking at texture on bones and bite marks and tooth serrations and even like sub-microscopic scarring on teeth. You can pick up even on good casts and good scans of them. So even that kind of, you know, we're talking literally microscopic data. But if you want to know how well it was growing, you need an original bone and you need to cut it in half and you need to take a section of that and you need to look at that. Um, or you want to run it through a synchrotron or something like that to look at the chemical signatures in the bones. We, we can't do any of this from a cast or from an X-ray or from a scan. 
fun fact, when the British were designing the first of their U-boats, they called them synchrotrons. Um, that's, that's not true. That's not true at all. Um, so, so okay, um, uh, like John's, bit, John's put an exclamation mark, so I know it's getting serious. Whoa. He says the Larsons found it and prepped it. I don't know what that means. So the, the, um, the Larson family at Black Hill. Oh, okay. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, like I I get said, you. Yeah, they, they found it. They... You know, a, a huge amount of work and time and effort and money has gone into Stan. You know, that is completely undeniable. Um, but as I say, you know, you've, you've got this thing floating around. There's lots of people with you know, the, the Indiana Jones meme that belongs in a museum. Most paleontologists would agree. But as I say, legally, Stan has been and has always been private property. And in the US, that, you know, that trumps an awful lot of stuff. And, you know, there, there is... At one level, Stan was always, we were lucky to see as much of Stan as we did. Um, and obviously people don't like that being taken away. And obviously in the current climate, using Indiana Jones is slightly ironic, given that he was putting stuff in museums, but mostly by going to other countries. <laughs> and massive colonialism violation of their heritage by just nicking it and running off back to the States with it. <laughs> Which is... What well, Mongolia is very anti, isn't it? Mongolia, you can't take any fossils out of there, can you? Yeah, and, and this this is the next like big, big problem that Stan selling for this amount of money is immediately going to do, is that it? I don't think at some level Stan is actually going to distort the fossil market that much, despite the fact that it has sold for far, far more than anyone anticipated, and that's probably going to change some things, you know, a... a Triceratops that sold for a quarter of a million last year will probably sell for a quarter of a million this year. It's not like that's suddenly going to go up in value five times because Stan sold for that much. Stan is a T-Rex, which immediately comes with a massive premium. It's very complete. I mean, it is a really good skeleton. There are loads and loads of bones. Um, there's the vast majority of the skeleton there. It's extremely good condition. It's very well preserved. It looks really nice. It's got some interesting little pathologies and things like that on it, and it's pretty famous, all of which add, you know, premium on, premium on premium on premium. Right. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily going to distort the fossil market that much. What it will do, though, is massively encourage fossil poaching and mm. boggy behaviour. I mean, I'm just thinking, Dave, if you want to go criminal, if there's, 30, you know, $30 million for a dinosaur... I mean, that's that's more than diamonds and gold. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, and th that's what the issue is going to be: is that you you know now immediately that, and, I, and I've seen this right. You know, I've got colleagues and friends on Facebook who are Bureau of Land Management in the U.S. You know, who are park rangers who obviously in, in paleontological national parks, paleontological central national parks. They're like, right. So the first thing that's going to happen now is that every Yahoo is going to go. That T-Rex was worth 30 million. We've only got to find a few bones and we're going to make tens of thousands. And of course they're not, but that's not going to stop them breaking in and stealing them. Um, yeah. It is a well-known problem. You know, there's lovely fossil track sites in Utah. A really common problem is people come in with circular saws at night and just try and cut footprints out of the rock. And of course, what they mostly do is shatter them because they have no idea what they're doing. And even if they do get them out, the market for people who want fossil dinosaur trackways is not that high. They're not easy to sell. The people who are spending tens or hundreds of thousands on this stuff know what stuff is. They know what it is. They know what a good one is. They know if it's been nicked. And so what you've actually done is just destroy priceless heritage. But it's going to happen a hell of a lot more now that people think it's valuable. And you can see, you know, I can see admin problems, you know, loads of museums are under threat right now. And I can just imagine that a museum, you know, a small museum is gonna get foreclosed or run out of money and an administrator is gonna come in or an administrator is already in post worse and go, right, but if we just sell that dinosaur, we can keep the museum open. And, I you know, there's a slippery slope that you're desperate for people not to go down. I don't know. You broke up a little bit then, so I'm just going to reiterate what you said, and that is basically small museums with valuable collections are going to be under pressure to sell them because at the moment museums are struggling due to lack of visitors due to the COVID situation, which yeah, is sad. Yeah, but and the thing is, again, it's 
it's going to be misplaced because I think people are going to go, well, if that T-Rex went for 30 million, then our Triceratops skull must be worth at least half a million or must be worth at least a million. And of course it just mm. isn't. Um, and then you're, again, you're just putting stuff on the well, wall. No, it might be. I mean, you, uh, you well, yesterday you'd have said, you know, five, 10, sort of 5 million for Stan altogether. I mean, it might be now that, you know, people are prepared to spend. If you've got, you know, mad, crazy, rich people willing to spend that sort of level of money on fossils yeah. that they absolutely adore, you don't know what's going to be valuable. No, that's um, true. I mean, so the, the, the final thing that's interesting with Stan in, in that regard is that Stan, it's a, so um, big fossils like this, and there, there, there's, a, there's a long history of this. This isn't unusual in its way. So Stan basically has a certain amount of copyright attached to it. Um, this is common for a lot of valuable fossils and specimens in the same way that, you know, the Mona Lisa and Van Gogh and stuff like this are copyrighted. Stan is, Stan is copyrighted. And incredibly, possibly because they didn't think it was going to sell for anything like this much, buying Stan didn't buy you all the IP of Stan. So you don't even own the copyright of it. And specifically, you have no license to sell copies and casts of it. And you have no license to sell merchandise of it. Um, wow. The other reason that I thought it wouldn't go for very much, because if any museums who might be interested, no museum is going to lay out five million for a specimen they then can't sell T-shirts and key rings of, let alone yeah. can't sell casts of, because they'll make a ton of money. So that's the thing. On top of this, Black Hill still retains all those current licenses. Um, so there's, a, which are arguably worth now even more because now mm. people want to cast off the $30 million T-Rex. Um, so there's all that side of stuff, which, I mean, I don't know, I really don't know what the implications of all that is, but it increasingly says that whoever bought it, and, and any, again, multiple people were bidding, any of those serious bidders had no interest in what Stan means for the public or in terms of merchandising or in terms of, marketing or making money from it or doing anything else which obviously really screams out i want to put it in my atrium in my mansion yeah I, I said garage you said atrium i was imagining a really fancy garage though with the t-rex yeah. or well right yeah. but, you know, here's my six ferraris and at the end is the t-rex and, and that's where uh, it's going um yeah. I mean, but the, the sad thing as well for this is you know just what that money represents so a colleague of mine worked out that you know she's just hired a postdoc recently on a grant she could have funded that student for, well, student, he's got a PhD, he's a postdoc, could have funded him for 530 years um, for that wow. money. Uh, someone else pointed out, uh, I think it was Dave Evans at the, at the uh, Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, if you put that money, put 30 million into an investment account and just ran off the interest, you could fund 50 researchers basically forever, just off the interest. I mean, couldn't, couldn't you sort of like do a sort of, weird dig with the same sort of specific specific could we ask like a million billionaire say you know same amount of money we'll go dig in areas where we know there are t-rex you can fund all of this oh, you get the originals we get to do all the science well, but, but, you could but, even if you, you gave, could do that yeah if you gave me 10 million dollars even allowing for all the costs of excavation and preparation and mounting and shipping and you'd have to pay landowners all kinds of rent and commissions and stuff I bet for $10 million, you could dig up a T-Rex, maybe not as good as Stan, but a decent one. And you'd find a ton of other dinosaurs as well. And you would get a hell of a lot more bang for your buck. Um, but so are we going to see, like Ross, Ross is sort of saying, are we going to see like a top Trumps now? Are uh, all of the big dinosaurs going to get bought up by sort of, you know, mad million and billionaires just going, ah, I want the best fossil for my atrium or whatever no but but only because so the the other reason that stan might have gone for as much as it did on top of it is well known it is particularly well preserved and it is yada 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 is they don't come on the market that often most of the really good specimens are already in museums are already in private hands and owned by people who aren't going to sell them anytime so like tristan tristan is an exceptional t-rex but the owner's probably got no intention of ever selling it. So if you want to buy a T-Rex and stands the only one available, 
then the, the price is whatever you're prepared to pay because it's we that don't know where Tristan is right now. Um, I can't remember where Tristan is right now. Tristan, ah. Tristan has moved to another museum and he's no longer in Berlin and he's on public display. I just can't remember where it's gone. Okay, um, but it is on public display. Belgium or I think Denmark or Holland. There's a bit of talk in the chat about who, who's, you know, who's got Tristan. So I don't want you to yeah, think so he's missing. Tristan, yes. I believe, is owned by a private British owner. Um, oh. But I, I, other than that, I, I don't know him. I haven't met him. I don't know his name. I'm, I'm aware that he exists. I'm aware that he's British. Um, that's about the limit of my knowledge. Um, and and Ryan's sort of gone back to my um, registration sort of argument. He says, there's no way that you can certify skeletons like cars and attach a serial number to each specimen and have it. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we need you know, more databases. That's what we need. Nothing goes wrong well, with a database. You know, but we're talking about that's the thing. You know, something like Stan sticks out like a like a sore thumb because it's a whole bloody T Rex. You know, whereas I, I've been, you know, I went to Morocco many many years ago. You know, before I even went to university, before I started studying dinosaurs. But you you walk along a street and there's a guy who's a fossil dealer and he's got buckets of spinosaur teeth and mosasaur teeth and shark teeth. I've been to fossil dealers in China that I've seen, you know, just lining the street. And every one of them has got 20 or 30 of these, you know, feathered birds just there on the wall. Some of these things are there in their hundreds or thousands. And that's just the stuff I'm seeing that I'm interested in. And from the few people who are really public with their, you know, selling these stuff, whereas a lot of this stuff is obviously done, you know, you, you don't walk down the street. and. Well, we we said we said in that episode so it's it was it doesn't work the the fossil episode which i think was episode seven um so it was episode seven of the first series of terrible lizards this is the podcast terrible lizards look at look at the expense spared that's what that's a mug you can get a, oh sorry that's a mug you can get a mug not him hold the mug <laughs> look weird uh but yeah uh so um but yeah um we were talking about how the fact that you know there is no um there, there's no like uh, people at the border checking going oh look there's a rock is this a really expensive fossil i have no idea yeah. shutting the case you can go through customs sir there's yeah. no education about this yeah and and you know and i'm i'm really sympathetic to that you know border control are dealing with you know people smuggling and drug smuggling and illegal imports of all kinds of other things and i fully understand that dinosaurs are not top of that list um, they're not even. They should be. The they should be. Don't be unforgiving. I, I know. Though again, you know, the, the zoologist in me goes, I'm far more concerned about lots of the dodgy pet trade than I am about dinosaurs in, in that regard, at least. Um, but again, you know, this is probably going to promote it because people are going to think that, you know, again, many of these things are valuable. They were before, and they are still now. But I, I'm sure more people are going to go. You know, little cartoon. Particularly now that. when jobs are hard to come by. There's a load of PhD students yeah, who are like, well, needing funding. Just go out to Montana and dig because everything's worth money. And it's like it doesn't work yeah. like that. You, you've got to know what you've got. You've got to know what you you know. And you, it's not like you'll just turn up at the roadside and be able to start selling this stuff. I had, tell you what, it would make a hell of a heist film, wouldn't it? Imagine, like, tonight, before they pack Stan all away, are you before they pack Stan all away, somebody goes people? in. And I nicks think, it. I think you find they made that in what was it, 1964? Yeah, that's a bit before my time, Dave. I'm sorry I haven't well, seen and that. mine, but it's it's one of those films that was on every Christmas or bank holiday Easter bank holiday. <laughs> you you had a lot more time on Easter bank holidays than I did. Uh but there we go. Um also top comment from John finding dinosaur fossils is very hard. Um, so <laughs> And that, and that, you know, you know, we said, you know, give me 10 yeah. million and I'll find you another T-Rex. It is hard and it's expensive and, you know, it does take time. You know, there's a reason not every museum has a T-Rex. But again, at the same time, if you've got 10 million or 30 million to dump on one of these things, I'm sure. And a long amount of time. Well, right. But, you know, it, it takes years rather than decades. Um, mm. I mean, uh, and going back to the money thing, because one thing I did want to talk about you know in terms of that money is like 
it does when when people are paying those kinds of sums, and even frankly, when they're paying fifty grand or two hundred and fifty grand for a skull or a skeleton for things, um, it I I do find it odd. Let's say that there is I I, un, I definitely understand the mindset. You know, I I've got artwork that I bought original artwork that I love having because I love having it and it's something that I love. I totally get that you think Especially. dinosaurs are awesome or you want something to show off to your mates and you can afford it, I totally get why you're buying it. What I guess I don't understand is why many of the people who do this seem to have absolutely no interest in it outside of the fact that they own it. Now, I know that's not true of lots. I do know some fossil dealers. I do know some private collectors who are absolutely really into the science and also donate money and specimens and their time and expertise and knowledge to collections. I know people who've built up huge private collections at great expense, who it's written into their will that it will go to a museum and everything's been legally signed off and it's a private collection now, but one day the scientists will get it and stuff like that, which is cool. But I would be willing to bet that whoever has just burned 30 million on Stan has probably never given a museum an endowment of even 10 grand. And wow. you know what we could do with 30 million. And like we said, you know, you could, you know, I say run 50 academics forever off the interest. 50 academics studying dinosaurs is probably as many as we've got in Europe combined. I don't think there are 50 professional, as in people in permanent academic jobs working on dinosaurs in Europe. In fact, I think there's probably more like about 25 to 30 of us. So you could double the research output of European dinosaur studies for eternity off that money. And if you really love dinosaurs, really love dinosaurs, and if you've got the kind of money where 30 million quid is nothing, or 30 million dollars is nothing. Just to say, if you have got that kind of money, Dave will change his name to whatever you like. <laughs> just to <laughs> just to dig <laughs> but you know it, it it really is like that you know mm. to to a degree and so i'm i'm as i say su both surprised and disappointed that that that's the case for a lot of these really big sales and i do think i think just before we end because um you know i said we'd do half an hour and we've done 37 minutes so we're going good as you as always stick to the time yeah, but it is <laughs> it, be more accurate yeah it's just it seems to me like incredibly sad that this is happening and it's it's the same with you know this idea of private ownership and everything else it just it breaks your heart well that, that, that's the thing there is there is a real loss here of of scientific data because people have published scientific papers on stan and you can obviously make a pretty legitimate argument that, well, they probably shouldn't have been given that it was privately owned. This isn't, you know, this the Black Hills was not an institute that was a public institute and everyone thought the specimens mm. were safe. And then for whatever reason, they went bankrupt and they were forced to sell it and the specimen vanished. That does happen even with public museums because that's what happened Money. with museums. But on average, it, of course, it, it it doesn't. This was something that we've always known was always private. And so should we really have been publishing on it in the first place when this was always a risk and now it's happened? It could be worse. I mean, it could be, you know, a bit like the rhino horn problem. You know, it could be going to erectile dysfunction. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> we've got to be thankful for that. But yeah. I mean, I mean, we are being very, um, you know, we're being very skeptical. We we may be proven completely wrong about this. This person might just have bought this for a particular purpose, which we'll all understand somehow. Yeah, I mean the. So again, you know, people say like, "Will it go to a museum?" Well, I I can pretty much guarantee that it won't. Or if it will, it won't go to a kind of mainstream museum, if you like. So I know a bunch of things that were bought in the last few years have gone to. Um, you know, the Arab countries to go into museums that they're building or just to go on display in, like there's a there's two or three dinosaurs in a shopping centre somewhere there, I believe. Um, that's all right. I mean, a part of me goes, that's bad because people aren't getting the full educational experience, but at least people are seeing them. True, but again, is is that then driving the market by making more people want to buy it and then if they've got the money, they'll buy another one? Or and... is it driving bigger interest in dinosaurs and people will be interested more in the science, well, therefore be going yeah. to real museums well, and donating and all the rest of it? So... Both, and of course, and that's the conflict between 
and you know, as I say, if we take it down to its micro level of the kid on the beach collecting ammonite or buying a little fragment of a dinosaur tooth in a museum shop, there is at some level obviously a connectivity between, well, if you're going to sell that, why won't you sell this? But equally, if that's what's driving the interest and in producing researchers and research interest and potentially investment and funding and even just people going to museums and paying to go through the door and buying a T-shirt, that's all good for the science as well. Um, and, and that's why, in part, I have a problem with people who are as extreme as no fossil ownership whatsoever, ever because it is more complicated than that. And there are lots of people who will tell you that they started off their interest in paleontology or started off their interest in science precisely because they went to a museum when they were six and in the gift shop, they bought an ammonite. And so like, yeah. if that hadn't happened, would they have felt the same way if they'd been able to buy a cast of an ammonite? Maybe, but... I mean, is... usually they're a kid, so they wouldn't be... Just lie to them. Well, true. But, but you know, <laughs> that or finding one on the beach or, you know, mm -hmm. any of those kind of equivalents. Um, you know, yeah, it, it is, yeah, much more, much more complicated than that. And yeah, and this is kind of what, why I wanted to kind of talk about all this stuff, because I, I think there's this perception. Obviously, there's lots and lots of people who are very knowledgeable about this, but I think there's a broader public perception that. Stan was in a normal museum and has been sold, and that's a horrific that right. of what museums and science should be. And that fundamentally isn't true. The truth of the matter, though, is infinitely more complicated. And in fact, it reveals how horribly complicated the tie up between public and private ownership and different legalities in different countries. So, yeah, Mongolia, it's illegal to privately own specimens and it's illegal to export them, it's illegal to sell them. So, that would never happen. And so, you know, different laws, different countries when the science is supposed to be universal and then different histories of specimens make it all a horrible tangled mess. And I think people don't appreciate that. That said, it would have been really nice if Stan hadn't sold for 30 million because it probably wouldn't have caused a lot of the problems that I'm sure it's about to. And it would have been nice that if it was going to be sold and it had to be sold, it went for 3 million quid, which a museum could have afforded and then would have bought it. And then yeah. we'd be going, hooray, Stan has gone to nice Pittsburgh museum of nice yeah. museum or Paris or who cares where if it's a proper public museum. And or even a place that donated it, you know, a person yeah. who donated it. But yeah. Anyway. So that's I, I think I think we've covered the topic. Very well. Well done, Dave. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just say the name of everybody who's been on the chat because I think you guys have been amazing. So, OK, Esther Chow, uh, Ross, John Patterson, John Connett, Esther again, Trevor, William, William, yay, um, uh, John again, Lloyd, Lloyd said hello, Paleo Draw said hello, um, Ross again, I think I said Ross, Lo Lo Sly said hello, that's really cool, um, but yes, Marcus and the, the, the others just talk too much, this I, thing, I, evolution I, number nine, good. I, uh, I all of them, not just the names. I'm, I'm reading I'm reading the ones I haven't read out before I think that's I think that's everybody um we've had quite a few people watching so thank you very much if you don't know we do a podcast and it's called terrible lizards it looks like that terrible lizards.co.uk that is um that is the rooster I drew it's a yeah. rooster not the other word for that and there is a megalosaur on the other side um but yeah um um so thank you very much and uh thank you so much for watching this was fun we will do it again thank you